our going to wrap up our program today with an amazing uh, panel of uh, very credible and very interested fans and friends of faith-based education, and I'm thrilled to be here with all of you, state and local leaders. So this is our policymakers discussion, and Rena and team uh, have a, left us a very hard act to follow with the incredible stories of success and impact that that are going around, uh, going on around the country. Uh, every single person on this stage is a fellow warrior and champion for faith-based education. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts about what you've heard so far. I know most of you have been here uh, throughout the day. And uh, Mayor, I want to really start with you and Mayor Rawlings. I guess I need to narrow it down <laughs> up here a little bit. My new mayor, the one I'm trying to suck up to, Mayor Baker, <laughs> uh, for point of clarification. Okay. Uh, is She'll do actually, anything for policy. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, you were really the, the impetus for this conference, and I want you to tell us how that came to be and why this issue is so important to you, what you see uh, uh, the meaning of for Dallas in this issue, and you know, I'm gonna start with you, Mayor, because you're the reason we're here, candidly. Well, thank you, and I, I'm gonna make some closing comments so I won't go on too long, but I will say that I have uh, uh, learned about what ACE has been doing uh, for years. My family, I was born, um, uh, had two grand, uh, grandpas that were preachers, and I had a, a mother that was a teacher, a father was a teacher, an aunt that was a teacher, another aunt was a teacher, another aunt was a teacher, an uncle was a teacher, and another aunt was a missionary, okay? <laughs> so next to preaching and teaching, everything else was kind of second, you know. Uh, and I, we, but we were Protestant, but I, I we might as well be Catholics now because I went to Boston College and my son went to uh, Christ the King here in Jesuit and all that. And Notre Dame, he finished at Notre Dame, learned about ACE and they were coming to play Arizona State. So the world circulates around football, okay, <laughs> basically. And it just seemed like a great opportunity to, to deal with this issue um, because uh, we know so many of the numbers, but for some reason, it's just ignored. It's swept under the rug. And so I love forums like this, intelligent people talking in a civil manner and starting these dialogues. So that's why I suggest we do it. And thank you for, this was kind of your first job, uh, first thing on the job. So thank <laughs> I bet you you're for, a month, Mayor. So thank you <laughs> for, thank you for thinking of something for me to do while I have just arrived. <laughs> Um, also, you have, I mean, I do want to give you just a, a chance to give Terry Flowers a shout out because, I mean, talk about somebody who was country when country wasn't cool. I mean, he oh. has been in this vineyard for a very, very long time and, you know, an amazing. Yeah, he leader. has. And, and he's, it's, it's more than just changing lives. He's able to, to change a city by doing something small like this. Uh, he, he didn't, we weren't able to talk about how he's taken this whole part of, of South Dallas and knock all the bad old no tell motels down and the liquor stores and um, this area. He got his, uh, his street uh, name, Pennsylvania Avenue, and he's got the same address as the White House. And, <laughs> and uh, his, his, the, you go into his school and you see those kids, they've got a creed that is longer than the Gettysburg Address. And, and it brings, uh, a tear to your eye and a hope for the future and you wish your kid had gone to school there. And, and then the other thing he's done, and I think this is so important, it started to integrate our city. We, his givers, okay, and we've got a lot of generous people in Dallas. I heard the quote the other day, 15 billionaires in the city of Dallas. That didn't even count the half a billionaires. <laughs> Um, those people that are, that are giving the money, for the first time, they've, they've never been in South Dallas, okay? Mm -hmm. And now they're starting to understand, and they don't get, you know, they don't get carjacked, and it's okay, and, and now the whole economic thing comes with it. So it's just one domino that starts to, to do a lot of things. He, he's one of my heroes. He Absolutely. Really Thank you, Terry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good place for me to bring in Mayor Williams, Mayor Tony Williams, former mayor of Washington, D.C., who's now the chair of the... Federal City Council and is uh, involved in plenty of life after public service, including the Consortium for uh, Catholic Schools that has become the all-world CNBC event of, of D.C. 
particularly in a time when bipartisanship and, and collegiality has become all too rare, Mayor, uh, tell our, our friends about what you all have done in D.C. And, and how it's built over time. It's an incredible effort. Yeah, we're a little, uh, uh, I work for a group called the Federal, work for I'm the CEO of the Federal City Council, which is a, which is a group started by uh, Bill Graham, Don Graham of the Washington Post, I guess formerly now, but for a long time with the Washington Post family. It was started as a pro-civil rights, pro-home rule group to push major projects that had an impact in the city that were hard to do where the civic leadership of the city could make a difference. And I say all that because one of the Federal City Council's major projects during my time as mayor working with the Bush administration uh, was pushing education and it was the Federal City Council that was strongly behind the Opportunity Scholarship Program, people like Joe Robert we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And so now I continue to uh, work uh, with Joe Robert's group called Fight for Children, raising money for education there, supporting choice in education, charter schools, uh, work with a consortium of Catholic academies and raising funds for uh, Catholic schools, parochial schools, and, and one of the uh, lesser rank, but one of the uh, group of the uh, Boehner, now Feinstein Williams Dinner, uh, formerly the Boehner Lieberman Williams Dinner, Speaker Boehner likes to talk about how his father ran a saloon. And Senator Lieberman said, well, you know, my dad ran a saloon too. And I said, well, my uncle went to a saloon. <laughs> <laughs> but we've raised, well, we've raised uh, now millions of dollars for uh, uh, scholarships and for choice in the city. And needless to say, Speaker Boehner has been indispensable in fighting that fight uh, at the last hour many times to keep that going. So uh, really, really excited about that. It's still big, big, big on my agenda. Nothing, I, you know, I came here really out of sense of loyalty to you and President Bush and because I believe in what we're doing. But I was figuring, you know, we're all going to pat ourselves on the back and just kind of have a victory parade part of the ceremony and then or session and another part of the session, session complain. But I think like all of us, I've learned a lot here. It's really been just fabulous. What's St. Philip's doing? what you're doing uh, in terms of uh, leadership education in Milwaukee, for example, uh, the uh, ACE, I mean, all these things are just fabulous to see. So it's a wonderful conference. Mary, you, I tip my hat to you. Great thank job. You. Thank you for coming. So, Mayor Williams, I hope you won't think I'm putting you on the spot to talk about the, just the political courage <laughs> that it takes and that it took. Uh, we were talking backstage uh, about some of this stuff on both sides of the aisle, candidly. I mean, will you talk a little bit about that dimension in D.C. and, and you know, how you truly w have been an amazing warrior for kids there and the results are and the improvement in the over, over this period of time have, were tremendous under your watch and leadership? Yeah, you know, my, my view was coming in Washington, D.C., for those who didn't know, uh, it wasn't like I got the car keys and just kind of drove down the road. When I took over, the place was a wreck. I mean, Absolutely. it was really amazing. It was unbelievable. No, nothing worked. Finances were broken. Everything was broken. So I just kind of think of how to get this thing back together again, how to conceive it. And some of you I've mentioned this too. My notion was that in our country, our founders wanted to create this new empire of liberty centered in the capital and that we would have a public realm rather than a private realm. It was always my abiding belief that in this public realm, it wasn't just secular public. It was secular and clerical, religious and non-religious. It was working people, wealthy people, all coming to fill the civic space and that there was some sense of, there was a unity of purpose to it. And to answer your question directly, I think as a public leader, someone mentioned the politicians. The difference between a politician using the derogatory term, and a leader is a leader uses political tools to be a leader, right? And my whole thing as a mayor was 60% of the time, it's your job to basically be the maitre d' of the city. So get the That's city. exactly right. Am I right? Yeah. Get, <laughs> you're like running the restaurant. Too? <laughs> it's your job to run the restaurant, make sure the food is warm, make sure it's served. <laughs> And you get your people to believe in you. And then once you believe in, once they believe in you, they will follow you. I do not believe this notion that, well, if I push vouchers or I push school choice or I really lead, my people are going to throw me out of office. No, if you have this agreement with your people that, yes, most of the time you're doing their bidding, but you're leading on the big issues, they will follow you.
no question in my mind. If I had run for office again, I think I would have been, I, I, well, I can't say without any doubt, but most people would say I would have been elected because I had that following of my people, Absolutely. and they believed in me. And one of the things they believed in is, even if they didn't agree with me on the school right. choice, they knew I was doing it for the right reasons. Amen, amen. Kathleen, that's a great place to bring my friend Kathleen Shanahan into the discussion who uh, we got to know each other in her service for Governor Jeb Bush and my service for Governor slash President George Bush. And we've had lots of good times over the years. Kathleen uh, was the chairman of the State Board of Education in Florida, now a member of the State Board of Education there, and did incredible uh, through this same kind of leadership, Mayor, that you speak of, uh, work and leadership on choice issues at the state level. Talk about some of that, Kathleen, what you've done and, and how that came together, the results and the challenges you've had with, with keeping all that going. Well, it's really been about following the leadership of Jeb Bush. I mean, I have to say, and Rick Baker will applaud this, the next speaker on the panel. Uh, you have to have leadership, like the, the mayor just said, and you have to come in and sort of lay out your terms and be real with the people that elected you and then put other people in place that you delegate that to, which I felt, you know, I was a soldier in the, in the Army of Education Reform in Florida and continue to serve on the State Board of Education. But Florida has been very focused on transformational competition and some of the earlier panels that mentioned, you know, parental choice and the opportunity for engagement on the local level. Uh, and we've had a very supportive legislature. I mean, so we have worked hard to educate uh, in this new world of, I think, new, new, educate, new public uh, education definition where you have accountability and metrics and knowledge that's much more in the landscape, in the parents' hands. And parents are not standing back and letting their kids go to bad schools. And so, you know, we've tried in Florida to engage the parents, have them be informed, and then make sure that we're offering enough competition and choice. And in that, we have, you know, and I don't want to be the um, rain on the parade, but, you know, I, I applaud the theoretical arguments and we need to take it on in the courts, but we have basically done, you know, what I would call a roundabout in business where we have uh, started a, you know, a tax scholarship program and it is all about companies who pay their corporate taxes and the legislature has set up a pool that you basically match that up to 75%. was started by one man's vision, John Kirtley, started it with 15,000 kids. We now have 60,000 kids in the state of Florida in this program. We have, you know, over a million and a half kids, I mean, over 200,000 kids in choice opportunities in Florida. So we have, you know, on the faith-based side, tried aggressively to use the tax scholarship to get into 1,500, you know, faith-based institutions, 40% which are non, you know, Christian, non-denominational, 10% Catholic, and we also have Muslim and, and, and Jewish faith-based organizations for these kids to choose to attend. And they get 90% of their um, scholarship money through the scholarship program that we've set up, and 10% is the parental involvement. And so I love the story about you have to have the parents there, they have to engage, they have to be responsible. It's not the teacher's responsibility. And lastly, I would just say, it is about the kids. You know, the one thing that Jeb Bush taught all of us every day in his uh, administration was, it's about the kids. Yep. The kids have to be the focus. It can't be the adults in the system. You've got to get past the adults in the system and say, how do I help this child to the stories that these other, our prior panelists told? How do we help this child graduate, succeed, bring their siblings along, bring their parents along, whatever it is? And I think if you stay focused on the kids, you can see some of the results that we've seen in Florida. And we're by no means done, but it's, uh, it's been an honor to serve on the state board. And, and we'll come back to this, but both D.C. And, and Florida, I think, are in the critical mass sort of. It, it's a, a major dynamic change that, that frankly, hasn't happened very many places mm -hmm. around the country, but in those two. Mayor Baker, I'm going to first start with the shameless <laughs> plug of this book that you've written called The Seamless City. About, I, I, I never object to that. No, I didn't think you would. Uh, you know, governing magazine says you're all that and so forth. <laughs> Tell us about your experience in St. Petersburg. From Give us a little case study of, of the themes that have come out here in sure. terms of leadership politics. And I'll, I'll start really where, where Kathleen started at the beginning. Uh, I, like Kathleen, I was one of the soldiers of Jeb's Army uh, on education in the state of Florida. And I worked a lot with him, uh, as did others. 
during the period of the desert, you know, in, the, in between 94 and 98, uh, after that, the first election and before he was elected in 98, and he was putting his education reforms. And I, I watched him as a mentor and the arrows that he took and the hits that he took and the courage that he showed to put the reforms in place. And, it, and it's not a linear path. Uh, it's a path where you go a few steps and you get knocked down, you got to move over and you got to start again. That's the way the voucher program was in Florida. It was not a linear path. You know, they started out trying to do the pure voucher program. The Supreme Court of Florida, which I think was not going to be inclined to be supportive of us, uh, threw it out. And so then they went back with the, the tax credit scholarships. That's been hugely successful. It's made such a big impact. The other thing, though, that Jeb did is the whole accountability uh, really movement and, and the a grading our schools, what an odd concept that was to a lot of people back in 98 and 99, that you should grade your schools based on the achievement of the students. That just seems so basic to so many of us, but, but uh, the, the attacks that he received as a result of that. Well then, in 01, uh, when I was elected, we decided to have a major uh, education program uh, from the city's perspective. And the, our city does not run the schools. Most major city mayors in the country don't run their school system. But that doesn't mean they should be involved. I think we're, we're long past the time when mayors can sit back and say, you know, that's not my job. I'm not going to worry about that. Because if you don't have good schools, businesses aren't going to come to your town. And if you don't have good schools, people aren't going to move into your neighborhoods. So if you care about your neighborhoods and you care about business, you better have good schools. So we, we, we put in place a school support program in the city that, that, that wove into Jeb's A-plus program for the state. So for instance, uh, one of the big problems that we had was retaining and attracting good principals. And, and, and it's no secret, we don't, I don't think any of us pay them what they should be paid. And so we put in a program that provided a significant bonus. By the way, all, every, all of our programs were raised with private, uh, private money, private individual money, private corporate money. We put into programs that provided principals with significant bonuses. Uh, I mean, a weekend on the beach with their family, a, a, a dinner at a nice restaurant with their, their spouse, and then maybe a $5,000 bonus if they either achieved an A as a school or they increased the letter grade from C to B, from B to A, had a tremendous impact on our ability to retain our principals in the school. We, we recruited corporate partners. We, have, we recruited 100 corporations in our community, major ones, to come and partner with every school in the city. So they would provide mentors and they would provide funding in some, some circumstances. And, and, and often strategic planning help for the city, which is for the school which was very helpful. And we did a lot of other things. One other one I'd mention is, is uh, the Doorway Scholarship Program, where we told a child in a free and reduced lunch program in sixth grade. And, and, and uh, the statistics, it's really hard to dig in and find the statistics, because I said, think sometimes they're hidden. And, and, uh, but I think they're probably under 50% graduation rates. We told them that if, you, if between sixth and 12th grade, you had at least a C average, your attendance was good, conduct was good, drug-free, crime-free. When you got to 12th grade, you got a four-year college scholarship, paid for with private money. And we went up uh, doing 1,000 of those college scholarships. And they graduated, these are free and reduced kids, they graduated at a rate of 93% during that time. That's incredible. Yeah. You, know, the, you know, the policy landscape clearly is shifting and has shifted. I mean, we you know, have all suffered slings and arrows. Much of what we built together was around these notions of closing the achievement gap, no child left behind, accountability, transparency. And on both sides of the aisle, we've seen it through the waivers from the U.S. Department, through state uh, uh, pleas for waivers, Republicans and Democrats alike. So I guess as I think about where we go from here, you know, what's our new point of entry with folks if testing is unfashionable, if uh, closing the achievement gap or the sort of civil rights empowerment, it, it seems to me that, you know, folks have kind of checked out a little bit. And, I mean, maybe I'm wrong or too much of a Debbie Downer, but, you know, how do we reinvigorate this school choice debate, this achievement debate in this era of, you know, risk on accountability and standards and controversy around those things? Mayor Williams? Yeah, I mean, I just speak from a, a boldly political point of view. I think one of the 
big fortifications in terms of defending the status quo is crumbling a little bit. That's the mainstream media. Mm. Mainstream media is very, very biased. I mean, you know, I've t again talked with a number of you. It's really still fashionable to be anti-religious, certainly. It's still fashionable to be anti-Catholic if you're an intellectual. Mm. And uh, in uh, the elite journals, it's very, very fashionable to just be dismissive let alone critical, you know this, of school choice and vouchers and everything. We're talking about faith, the importance of faith-based education and the fact that the mainstream media now is disintegrating because of market conditions and new technology, I think, gives an opportunity. I think there are some actors out there that we need to pay attention to who are very powerful. These are kids who are out there organizing for charter schools. It happened to be charter schools, but I think we can learn lessons uh, in our group here from what they're doing. One guy, uh, uh, Andrew Seth is his name, uh, Democracy Prep in New York, mm -hmm. did a lot of work up in, this, now this, again, to be direct, this white guy up in Harlem, totally got organized in Harlem, very successful, very uh, successful academically charter school in Harlem. He's now coming down to DC and he's got the right notion. We've got to answer the question, why is it if one of us opened up a faith-based school we would have parents lined up to get their kids into the school. And then if there is a, a, a referendum or something or any kind of political activity where the parents have to stand up and support it politically, they can't be seen. So in DC, the example would be line up to go to a good school in terms of choice, but then we wanna take one of the lousy old public yeah. schools and use it for a charter school or a faith-based school and all the parents are up in arms because you're taking away our school. And what he's about is trying to bridge that disconnect and get people better mobilized. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I'm personally, our group, personally involved in DC in trying to support that notion and, and, and get that propagated and uh, replicated around the country. Kathleen? I think it's really, I mean, I've seen on the State Board of Florida the power of the mothers. I mean, I'm telling you, I don't <laughs> care if they, whatever they do during the day, they care about their kids getting an education. And if you can empower the mothers and give them right. the ability to have transparency in the data, they want their kids to succeed. Right. They will affect policy more than anybody else. And that's what we saw with this, you know, Florida tax credit voucher program that passed. In 2001 it passed, 2002 it was instituted. Zero democratic support in the state. At the legislative level, zero black caucus support. Five years later, the majority of the Black Caucus supports it, and the majority of the Democratic members of the legislature are active supporters of this. They are not shy supporters, and that is singularly because of the mothers. Most of those kids, I think it's like 60 to 75% of those kids are in uh, single, family, single parent families, and most of these kids are going to faith-based schools. So there is a way if you get the data out. I mean, I just, I think if you try to use mainstream media and think you're gonna get applauded, right. you're gonna die in the vine. You <laughs> gotta use the blogs, you gotta use all sorts of this alternative media to educate your empowered people, which are the parents, because they do care and they do know. Mayor Rawlings, uh, you know, you're currently serving mayor. What do you, mm. what, when you look at your colleagues around the country, do they get this? Are they willing to suit up for the battle royale that I, is Yeah, I think two things are happening. And first of all, let me preface this, that I'm, I don't know if I'm the only, but I'm one of the few Democrats probably in this uh, hallowed uh, uh, No, there's one here. right okay. down the oh, aisle from you. Are you, yeah, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> People say I've forgotten, but I'm officially okay. a Democrat. Obviously. And so I speak from, from that point of view, and I, um, what I'm seeing though, you say moms are gonna take over, which they do, they always do, follow moms. But the marketplace closely follows. Mm -hmm. So you have these big democratic urban mayors, that's what I'm seeing out mm -hmm. there, that have woken up and said, oh, the reason people aren't moving to our city Thank you. is the school system. Mm -hmm. I better do something about the school system. And I'm speaking about me, okay, just like this. And you go, I. So let me read the books, let me understand what the data is, and then say, oh, it's not working the way we've done it before. We've got to do something different. We've got to do some of the things Governor Bush, you know, talks about, you know. And 
suddenly the politics are starting to fall down. I mean, did they, did Mayor Villagosa in LA have his issues? No question, okay? Does Mayor Nutter have his issues in Philadelphia? No question. Mm -hmm. But they somehow power through this. Emmanuel. Okay, Ron Emanuel, <laughs> no question. And, and they power through this and then suddenly it's not so um, uh, black and white, DNR, you know, pro-labor, pro, -labor, pro you know, uh, God, you know, all these little cliches, mm -hmm. and, and we're starting to solve problems. So I'm a little more hopeful because at some of the levels, the Democrat, uh, the, 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 uh, the politics are being taken out of this. Yeah. Uh, I told a story earlier with being in a car with President Bush and Mayor Richard Daley talking about the closing of Catholic right. schools in Chicago. And I'm wondering, do you all, have you seen the tide turn uh, around the country, Mayor Baker, Mayor Rawlings, Mayor Williams, are people starting to recognize what an asset Catholic schools are, faith-based schools are? Well, I, I think you first start out was, is why, why did they start to lose population? I yeah. think anytime you're trying to analyze something, well, why did it happen? What happened, yeah. And I think there are two things that, that happened. I think one is competition and the other is cost. So you have, for instance, in Florida, you've got, uh, we now have fundamental school programs, we have magnet school programs, we have IB programs, we have charter schools. So there's a lot of opportunities, competitive opportunities, for people that want a quality education. So the competition is clearly there. And the cost element, if you look at the statistics in Florida, clearly with the private schools, uh, they were actually doing pretty good up until until the, the bust in about 06 and 07, they really started taking those dives. So the economy had a tr profound impact uh, on, on the, the, the people's ability. They're, they're looking at, well, I have some of these other options and this is costing me money and these are free. I'm gonna go to the free ones. And, but I think what, what Kathleen was talking about with the tax credit scholarships, it has had a remarkable impact uh, in the state of Florida, 60,000 kids that can now go to private school on these tax credit scholarships, it's $4,800 per scholarship, is, is the, the statistics I've seen on the last two years is there's been an, a, 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 an upswing back uh, on the, on the, uh, in the private schools in Florida. And if you, and they've actually dug in and measured the entire upswing is the result of the, the combination of the McKay scholarships and the tax credit scholarships that we have in Florida. If you were to take those away, the decline would have continued there. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in those schools, or responsible for those schools, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure two things. One is I try to get locked into some of these programs so that they can be in my state and, and, and help, help uh, have that cost differential not be the same. But also recognize I can't just sit back and say, you know, because I've been, I'm a private school and I've always been great, I'm gonna continue to be great. I need to understand I'm, com I'm competing with a lot of very good options that are coming to the table and I have to be in the room mm -hmm. with technology, with you know whether it's a Khan Academy type of program or whatever it's gonna be to make sure I am competitive with these other, other schools and, 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 and continue to be true to your core mission or your faith because my children went to a, a evangelical private school not because I could have sent them to a great fundamental school in my city, but I wanted them to have a faith-based education. So yeah, I think you have to be true to your, your mission as well. So we've talked about, these are policymakers, the importance of money, scholarships, whether it's privately available or opportunity scholarships, public funds, the, what you all have done in Florida. We've talked about the power of transparency and accountability to help make the case. Uh, early, our earlier panel talked about leadership. What can policymakers do to be additive to this need for leaders in these schools or other policy tools. We know money, we know transparency. What else? The, all of these people are gonna go back and talk to their state legislatures or city councils or county commissions or whatever. What should they tell policymakers about the levers to advance this movement? Mayor I, Williams? I would say to all of you, uh, you know, as uh, mayor, one of the people I got to, one of the nice things about being mayor of D.C., well, the bad thing about being mayor of D.C. is you've got the federal government there, but the good part of it is, is the federal but government. not as bad there. as it is now, mayor. <laughs> no, I was. no, but the good part is I can meet people like Margaret and <laughs> President Bush, uh, Lord knows. And uh, one of the people I met was Michael Deaver, who had been very successful communications chief for President Reagan. Now, Whatever you think of President Reagan, I suspect here it's uniformly positive, but you know, whatever you think of President Reagan, uh, everybody in the country knew what President Reagan stood for. He stood for America's good, Soviet Union is evil, 
and re reduce the size of government. Storm hits, America's good. I mean, he, he knew what his <laughs> message was. Boom, what's the weather, President Reagan? America's good, okay? Well, what I learned from that is that you do have a bully pulpit. Again, we're told often in public life, well, the bully pulpit doesn't really work. Yeah, it doesn't work if you don't stick to your message. Mm -hmm. So what is the moral here? The moral is if, if, a, med if a mayor has education as his or her main bucket on these three tubs and you're over and over and over again for all the reasons we're saying, talking to city leaders, talking to mothers, talking to groups all over the city about the importance of education, you can move the needle. There's no doubt in my mind. And I think one of the great things that the Institute can do, I would suggest is give, you know, I wouldn't maybe say talking points, but a playbook mm -hmm. for mayors who want to do right. Here's a playbook. Here are the steps you need to take to move the dial, move the needle, education in general, and faith education in particular. Because I tell you, in D.C., you know, Nicole's paper about the importance of faith education and neighborhood structure, no, I mean, you know, I'm not a scientist, but no doubt in my mind, just empirically from the Dub point of view, definitely true. I think right. one of the big reasons why in Southeast D.C. crime is going down dramatically is because these kids now have more choices, the parents have more choices, kids have more structure, and part of that structure is the structure of faith. Thank you. Kathleen, you know, you're a policy wonk extraordinaire. I mean, you've heard one of the big needs being <coughs> leadership. Is that, an, is that an area where uh, the state of Florida could think about, or what, what are policy levers that you all are thinking about going forward by, as ways to, you know, continue to foster their success? I think Florida, I mean, I think that there's, um, I always have to chuckle, Margaret and I used to get on the phone when she was in Texas and I was in Florida, and we'd, we'd always want to one-up. You know, we were both working for two brothers, and it was always like, we're going to do this in Florida. That hadn't, well, that's not we've already right, done that. It? We've already done that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see you're getting the jab in. What are you going to do in Florida? Um, anyway, I think it's really about continuing to challenge your public leaders. I mean, I, I think they need to, first of all, understand the results that choice and opportunity, faith-based education does for their kids that vote for them, that have parents, that get engaged, and connecting those dots in a very real way. I, I, you know, you can't, you have to stand up and ask for the order. I mean, I've, I learned in lots of different lives and, uh, that you have to ask for the order and you have to ask people to stand up and, and be counted. And it is hard, but if they're heard and they're listened to, they also know that they can be impactful in a system. So I think that, um, you know, in Florida, it's really do we go back and, you know, we've got a Supreme Court that did a, had a ruling on, you know, specifically on the Blaine, that they, they ignored the Blaine uh, Amendment, and they really went at it uh, in 2002, or 2006, they ruled on Article 9. So they totally ignored the faith-based part of the argument and used the, the legislative, you know, let's hold the legislative, basically set a ceiling for where public funding could go on education. You know, should somebody go back and challenge that? Yeah, you know, you need to use all the arsenal, but you also, you can't put all your eggs in that one basket. And that's what I'm saying. That's why with the tax scholarships are a roundabout. Getting the democratic legislative leaderships actively engaged and educated by parents getting in buses and going to Tallahassee and telling them about their kids successfully graduated from college. So all of that happens across the landscape and I would say no details too small. You have to stay engaged on every detail in terms of making sure that it's coordinated and it's focused on transparency and accountability. For the yeah. record, Florida does a whole lot better than Texas on school <laughs> choice. I, might add. Uh, so, uh, I, yeah, I just wanted good. to add one thing to, to this notion of leadership, and I, it, this, is, this is a little bit tough medicine, but I, I, I need to say this. There's no question we need to hold our leaders accountable. They need to have a point of view on policy and not just give glib little answers, mm -hmm. okay? So, so, so that, is, that is so, so important. On the other hand, okay, I learned this a long time ago, okay? We've got the school system. We've got the school uh, strategies that we deserve right now because our citizens have not st stood up and said we demand better. And we say, no, no, it's not the citizens' fault, mm -hmm. it's the politicians' fault. That, that's not accountability. Mm -hmm. Our citizens have got to stand up and demand that our kids are gonna get educated right. And when we get militant about this issue, mm -hmm. things will change. 
So every time I talk to citizens, the biggest issue out there is apathy. They don't care about it. You know why? My kids graduated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm through with it. Yeah. And you know, it, it, we all are relieved once the kid gets graduated. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, other kids in our whole world is growing up around us. So I'm, I'm a big believer that citizens have got to take accountability on this issue. But as you well. have to make sure that the citizens in the hardest hit communities have a voice to no the question. offices in power because no it's a very intimidating process no for question. those parents. And I, I, they have to feel that they're accessible and their voice is as equal as the higher income earning neighborhoods. I, I agree 100% with well, that. Well, and the yeah. phenomenon, Tony, that you talked about with on the one hand, right. yeah, we're lined up for school choice, but wait a minute, do not close that right. sorry mm -hmm. school in my neighborhood. You right. know. So to get to your point, how do you organize those mothers as a nucleus to organize the citizens? I think I'm thinking going away from here, yeah, that's what we got to do. So I'm going to give you a chance sure. before I turn to Rawlings to wrap us up. You know, Jeb Bush likes to talk about the marketplace of ideas. And, and, and I think that it, it, both are true. The, the citizens have to, have to give their voice, but somebody's got to stand up. And, and you know, Jeb Bush had to stand up. And, and mayors have to stand up. And they have to, they have to be able to articulate the vision and sell the vision to the community. And, and, so, and people will follow, if, you, if, if you've thought it through, if you're accurate, yes, the special interest groups are going to attack you and sling arrows, and you're just going to have to say, that's part of, that's, to me, that's part of public service, taking mm -hmm. those arrows. And, and, but somebody's got to stand up and lead those folks, and I think they will come on. You know, a very short example of that. What, what Mayor Williams was saying was, is, is so true. The, 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 the voters are really very smart. They're, they really are, and and if and if somebody has the courage, he was talking about, you know, if he had run for re-election, he would have gotten. I'm certain he would have, even though he took very controversial positions. You know, when I ran in 2001, the uh, the, the uh, Midtown, which is our poor African American, poor, the largely African American, low economic area of the city, when I ran the first time, it was that those districts were won by the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party. Okay. When, when I, and, and, they, and people had sprayed painted my signs. I had red signs, they sprayed them in bed with Jeb and they put them all over the place. And I, I like Jeb, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but not that much. Not that much. So, 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 so uh, uh, that, that didn't go my way, right? Yeah, yeah. But we, 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 we governed, as, I governed conservatively fiscally, we lowered tax rates, we cut staffing, we increased police officers, we enforced crime, and socially. I have the arrows to prove I was a social conservative. Four years later, though, we also attacked the redevelopment of that midtown with a vigor mm -hmm. and made a change. Four years later, I ran for re-election against the chairman of the Democratic Party, and I won the midtown precincts by 90% of the vote. Wow. Now, if, well, the point on that is not that I was great. The point is people get it. Yeah. If, if, if you step up, and, and you, uh -huh. you, you, you have the courage to do it, and you make the change, the voters will follow you. Mayor, that's a pretty good note to close, a, close us down. Well, I will uh, step over here since I wrote some notes, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, and once again, Margaret, thank you, Secretary, for, for uh, hosting this. It's been fabulous. I, I also want to say thank you to the people that did the work, not you and me as much, as uh, Carrie Briggs right down here and John Schoenig. These people have been working very hard to make this. They, everything you see today is because of their hard work. God is good. And all the time, we got it, okay? There's a lot of people that don't know what to do there. And I just wanted, and that was kind of what I was brought up in, in Sunday school, the first big word I learned was omniscient and om omnipotent and omnipresent, okay? I thought I was pretty smart in Sunday school learning that God was all those three things. The point is that omnipresence, if I believe that, he's in schools. And if he's in schools, really, what, how do we deal with this issue? There's a writer uh, that just wrote a book called More God, Less Crime, um, Byron Johnson, who just 
kind of documented that when you enter faith in different programs, outcomes happen. And it's very sociologically uh, driven. And I think that's what we're talking about today. So when I see uh, the numbers that we spoke about earlier, it shouldn't be a surprise to us. But over the years, for many reasons, our school system has become more secularized. Some we've talked about. But we've got to realize that God is different than religion. It's a really tricky thing. And people kind of like God. Sometimes they don't like religion. And so they've, they've kind of put their hand up here. And we need to figure out how to deal with that issue. Good reasons they don't like religion. A lot of these private religious schools were, were, were racist. They uh, were abusive. They uh, were radicalized. And they have bad science, some of them today. So there are some headlines that give some people some good reason to, to, to question what we're talking about today. I'm a big believer that change only comes when you're really intellectually honest with yourself and say, how do we deal with this? If God is good all the time and everywhere, but yet our school systems are secularized, how do we work through that? Why is this important to me? It's important to me because of what we just talked about. We've got 140,000 school children in, in Dallas, Texas. Most of them, 85%, uh, are on, uh, below the poverty level. Dallas is going to be fine for the next decade. I, I really believe that, next five, maybe 10 years. The question is, is it going to be great in the next 20 years? And they, the answer to that is what we do with those 140,000 kids. We know one of the biggest issues that uh, faces us today is this income gap. We live in a barbell society with the very rich that I, I talked about, and 39% of Dallasites are asset poor, meaning they only have enough money to live on for the next three months, and then they're gone. They're on the streets. And when you equate school performance against that, there is a 95% R-squared correlation on what is happening there. So I'm a believer that education is the long-term solution to this issue. But we've got this kind of camps that we live in. And boy, the biggest camp, what do we, your mother tell you to do? Never talk about politics, sex, or religion around the dinner table, okay? Because that's what's going to get us all arguing. One of the things that I think we need to do is to make sure that we understand a couple of important facts. One, that the, the numbers speak for themselves, that the, the, the higher performance. On the other hand, we've got to scale this. That's what I deal with every day, 140,000 kids, not 5,000 or 8,000. We've got to figure out how to do this in a big way. For me, the answer is a portfolio approach to make sure I take every good idea and put it on the playing field. Because we know how many TV stations there are. <laughs> there are probably that many different learning behaviors. We've got to hold them accountable to the numbers, but we've got to realize that Faith-based education has an important role in that portfolio. On the other hand, it may not be the answer to all the public school issues that we face. And so now we start to kind of talk about roles. Would it be wonderful if, if we, all of our kids perform that way? That's great. The second thing I think we need to do is realize that we agree with each other a lot more than we think. I was taught, we talk about leadership, Secretary, and I was taught that great leaders are, are like 
leaders of mountain climbing expeditions. They don't just all get together and say this is the way and they climb to the top of the mountain. They climb, they create a base camp. They make sure everybody's healthy, everybody knows it, they know the plan for the next day, and they create a next base camp. And I think that's what this conversation is intended to do, to create a base camp of understanding and agreement. And you said it, we all agree with personal goodness. Isn't that the truth? I have not heard one person that says, I don't like goodness. Now, goodness and godness are, are very closely related as faith believers, as, as I believe. But if we can get people understanding that, and we see it, I see it in our public schools all the time, all the, the characteristics that are put up all over those things, that could be a, that could be a Christian school, that could be an Islamic school. And I think that's what we need to start to think about. How do we talk about goodness and the roles that we play as opposed to doctrine that everybody's scared about? That's one of the things that will get us, get us going. The other thing to me, or the last thing, is, is what we talked about. We've got to get more focused on policy and less focused on politics. You know, this whole funding mechanism is broken. We know it is, and it needs to change. I think it can change. Texas is not taking a leadership role in it, and it needs to do better. And we've got people from both sides of the parties that should be able to deal with this issue and lead. I'm so proud that, uh, that Florida, what they've accomplished. And then also, we've got to have clarity around metrics and outcomes. We've got to all be agreed with that. In business, I'm a big believer in what we call stacking and racking for sales guys. Okay, we're all sales of who's at the top and who's at the bottom. I've always believed that if we took our urban school systems and we ranked those things, there'd be a lot fewer mayors down here, a lot fewer board of trustees dealing with, because people don't want to be last, even though they don't understand these things, they need to, they want to be at the top. And we've got to have common metrics across this country to understand our excellence. And lastly is, is, uh, is attitude. I love the thought that uh, it's, we've got a proud history but a perilous future. But uh, also this notion that out of crisis comes creativity and comes determination and comes a new way. And if we can create, okay, this, okay, I mean, think about what America has created, what we can do here. Surely we can create a new way to educate, to fund the best and the brightest in this country. And for me, it starts with God being omnipresent in lives across this country, and that's what makes it great. So I'm most encouraged when I see those young men up here giving their lives to the future of education. Thank you all that are interested here. Just maybe you're not talking, but this is what you've chosen to do. Because you understand in the next 20 years, this is the battle for our future. God bless you, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayors. Thank you, panelists. Can't thank you, Kathleen. Uh, what a day. What a great day and lots of uh, food for thought. Thank you, everyone. We stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>